Very cool. It's two after. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and Zoe, if anybody else comes in the waiting room, if you can just kind of keep an eye on that in case we have any stragglers. Um, and just a few housekeeping things. Um, feel free to put your camera on, but please keep yourself on mute just to minimize any background noise, any echo, anything like that. Um, and feel free to throw in the chat if I'm going too fast or too slow. Um, and if you have any questions about wolves, feel free to throw those in the chat too. Um, we're gonna have a little intermission with a little uh, presentation for you. Maybe that's gonna answer a couple of those questions. And if not, we can do some answers after that. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. My name's Katie Schneider. I'm a Rockies and Plains program representative for Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I'm based out of our Denver field office and my focus is solely on the Colorado Wolf program. Um, so I will be your painting instructor and your presenter today. Um, I have no credentials to be a painting instructor. So this is gonna be pretty fun. Um, hang in there with me and we're gonna have a good time tonight. I'm gonna start with what we are using for materials today. See your black, I have white. I have this fun like mango yellow guy. This was terracotta, also very like pumpkin spice. It's gonna be very fall themed painting. And then burgundy, and those are all of our colors. I also have a palette with me. If you don't have an artist's palette, you can use a paper plate, piece of cardboard, just about anything can work as a palette. I also have a cup of water to rinse off my brushes and a, a spare rag or paper towel that you don't mind getting dirty. And then for brushes, I've got a big guy that we are going to use for the, to fill in the big areas, kind of a medium guy for the ridge lines in the mountains, another little medium round brush, and a really tiny one for when we go to color in our wolf for the details, it's about the size of a pencil. So small, medium, large is really all you need. And then a painting palette to mix your colors. You can also use your brush, it's totally fine too. And then I'm using a pencil just to kind of trace out where our mountains are going to be. Um, if you have charcoal, um, chalk, anything like that, that can rub off and won't show too much below the paint, that works perfect. Everybody's ready. Let's get started. So I'm using a 12 or a 16 by 20 canvas, but really any shape, any size would work for something like this. It's also really customizable. So you can really tweak this to however you want it to look does not have to look exactly like mine and it's still gonna be beautiful. And this is what we are painting today. I don't know if the colors are gonna show up super well, but we're gonna have four ridge lines forming the Rocky Mountain Range. And then we're gonna have a wolf howling in the front to the sunrise. So we're gonna start out by doing our frontmost hill. So when you think of a mountain range, you kind of have the steepest ones in the back and they get much more um, smooth and less hilly as we get to the front. But you still don't want them to be smooth rolling hills. It looks more like a meadow. We want Rocky Mountains, right? So I like just taking my pencil like this, kind of funny, but helps you kind of get your, your shakes actually works really well for, for painting these kinds of mountains. I'm gonna start about a quarter way from the bottom here. And just, I don't know, make this one I want. You can go up. I'm gonna try and go a little harder so that you guys can see it on here. Maybe a little dark. Zoe, can you see that pencil at all? Yeah, we can see the faint outline. Okay. So there's my first tail and our wolf is gonna go just about here. So don't worry too much about this like bottom left corner section because a lot of that's gonna be covered up anyway. But I'm gonna start just a little bit above my first line that I made. I'm going to have this one be just a little bit more hilly, but I'm going to gonna start going up. I come back down and I'm going to end higher than where I started. They don't necessarily need to start and end at the same point. You want pretty unique, different mountains the whole way that you go up. And then starting on my third mountain, I'm going to start a little higher and start about maybe a third of the way down from the top here. And I'm gonna make this one even more steep. So I'm gonna go all the way down like this, bring us up. 
actually end pretty close to where my last one ended. And then finally, for our farthest back mountain, this is our last mountain. So don't fill up the whole sky. We do want some sky showing through, but I'm going to make this sky really pointy, feeling like a pointy mountain. And instead of starting at the end, like all the other ones, you sure can do that if you want to. I'm going to start a little bit into my last ridge line, and that's going to make him have even more depth. So I'm going to go straight up from here. Not too pointy, I'm going to go all the way down like that. And that actually looks like Long's Peak, which is right outside my window. And so here's our mount line, or mount our outline for our mountain range. So if you guys are ready, I'm gonna jump into our first set of colors. And we're actually gonna go backwards the way we drew them. So we're gonna start with the lightest color in the sky and get darker as we go. Because as you color off, uh, wash off your brush, that uh, water can get pretty dark and we don't want bleeding that into the lighter colors. Can't see it anymore. Don't know how much I can change the brightness, how it's showing up, if that's maybe any better. Now the sun's going down, so the lighting in here is a little spotty. Alrighty, so I'm going to start with the color of our sky. And so I'm going to take white, plain old white. I'm going to make a glob of that in here. We're only using six colors total today. So as long as you have enough room for that on your palette, you are all good. Is my picture gone? So there were a couple comments that said you disappeared. Um, can people still see? Turn it off and turn it back on. How's that? Can you see me again? Um, still can't see, at least from one participant. Oh, she can see. Yeah, I think we're good. Can everyone else see? Does that look better? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Like I said, I want a little dark on those lines just so you guys can see, but you want those pretty lights so you don't have them showing through. So we got a big glob of white on our palette. We haven't done any painting yet. And you want to squirt some yellow that's about a quarter of what you did with the white. So I have this glob here. I'm just put a little bit of yellow on that guy. No mistakes. I'm just going to mix that around with my brush until I get kind of a, a light peachy yellow color. Kind of like butter popcorn. That's what we'll call it. And I'm pretty notorious for over uh, pouring my paint. So I'm trying to start small. And if we could need to mix more down the line, that's totally fine. So I'm going to start with these big middle sections. I'm just going with my buttered popcorn paint and not go too close to those uh, these outlines yet, because we'll go in with that with a smaller brush to get some of those bumpy details in there. Don't forget to get your corners in your sides of the canvas. I always forget those. Look silly when I hang it up on the wall. So excited to see everybody's painting when we're done. All right, I have the biggest area of my sky filled in. I'm gonna dip that in my water, get that guy washed. And then I'm gonna go in with this little angled brush. It's even a little smaller than I probably need, but any size will really do. I'm just gonna start with the left-hand side and follow my pencil line all the way across.
Sorry for the shadows. Like I said, the sun's going down. Hope you guys know how much Bob Ross I watched in preparation for this, really trying to channel that calmness. Let's see if I come up with any good puns. They're usually pretty terrible. Remember to keep those little ridges in my mountain. Paint's also going to be probably pretty shiny while it's wet on my camera, so. It does not look very solid. That's probably why. Make sure you don't have any globs on your edges, because we're going to be coming in next with that next mountain color. Okay, and that is our sky. I'm going to move on to this farthest back mountain now. He doesn't take up too much space, so you're not going to need too much paint for this guy. I'm going to go with a pretty actually similar color to our sky because we kind of want it to blend in just like it is during the sunset. And so we're going to do equal parts white and yellow. Even that was probably way more than I needed. One thing about a painting like this, though, if you want your mountains to be blue, green, purple, rainbow, you can do that. I was feeling like something fall related. All right, so I got my next glob. Way more than I needed. And again, I'm going to go right for the middle first and then go in with a tinier brush after that. Mine looks more like mac and cheese before you add the noodles. Just eight, and it's kind of making me hungry, to be honest. Yummy color. Now that I think of it, I think half my paints are named after food. I don't know why I keep thinking of foods that they look like. Alrighty, my middle of my back mountain is all filled in, so I'm going to grab that same little brush that I had last time. Go with that same color, and then just trace along those pencil lines we need. Going up along this other paint, be careful if they start to mix together. I'm going to try and keep a pretty solid line. To the tippy top. Showed a friend of mine what we'd be painting tonight, and she said, Why aren't you doing? you know, a wolf howling at the moon. Why is it the sunrise? And I told her that wolves don't actually howl at the moon. That's one of the things that we get from uh, stories and movies. They're around much more at night and they love dawn and dusk. So I think that's probably where that came from, but nothing to do with the moon itself. Werewolves. And don't forget to get those sides of the canvas. 
Like I almost forgot. And our first mountain is complete. How's everyone doing? Am I going too fast, too slow? Doing great. Sweet. It's looking lovely. As long as you can still see me, that is all that matters. Okay, so we're gonna go towards our second mountain now. And we're gonna bust out our pumpkin spice latte here. If I can open it. Another glob of that guy. We're gonna do three quarters of this terracotta color and a quarter of the mango the yellow. Like that. That was probably a little too much yellow, but that's fine. Well, from a big brush. Start mixing that guy together. And plus mango equals carrot. That's what I'm calling this one. And you know the drill now. We're just going to start in the middle here. This color is a little bit more streaky and thin for me, so I'm trying to go on a little thick. We don't want it so thick that it won't dry later. We're gonna do this whole background. And I'm gonna take our little intermission in the middle. Come back and do the wolf afterwards. Oh, I'm supposed to just be doing the middle. I'm already not following my own directions. All right, I think that's the biggest section I can do. I'm going to get my smaller brush. Dry him off a little better. Might need to mix some more carrot color. gonna be pretty close, but I think I'm gonna need some more. That's okay. Starting to mix with the mango a little bit, so I'm gonna wipe my brush off. Get it all clean, start again. And the edges, just smooth some of this out. Had just enough.
All right, and there is ridge number two. We are halfway through our background. All right, moving on to our third mountain. I'm gonna grab my terracotta again. that guy and we're going to do three quarters of the terracotta and one quarter of the burgundy just like that by sticking with only a few colors and kind of mixing them together to make all these shades. That's what makes these colors really complementary with each other. You could even stick with one color and just mix more and more white if you, as you get towards the sky. Okay. I'm struggling for a food for this one, but it's a very pretty red color just a bit deeper than our orange. And so I'm gonna go right in the middle with this one. White apple. Not pink as raspberry. Definitely gonna need more of this one. I'm gonna mix some more of this guy. Kind of. Got that pretty close, yep. Finish filling in my middle. We're getting into where our wolf is gonna go on top. So again, don't make this bottom left section too thick on paint. So make sure he doesn't need very much time to dry. That's good for my middle. I'm gonna go in with my smaller brush now. too wet. I've done this painting on a round canvas before and that turned out pretty cool. It reminded me of like a porthole on a ship. Remember, you like those little jagged edges. Shaky hands are good for this year. The, hard, the farther back you hold your pencil or your paintbrush, the more you get that just little bit of shake. Bottom
almost to the end of this guy. It's been a little streaky, so I'm going to go back in with my big brush again just to smooth out some of these streaks. I just like that. Okay. We have our our frontmost hill left, our foothill, and we're going to use the flip flop combination that we just did. So we're going to do three quarters burgundy. And this guy's a pretty big section, so we probably want the most paint for this one. And one quarter of the terracotta. Adding that little bit of orange doesn't change the burgundy too much, but gives it just that hint of warmth to go with the rest of these colors. I'm loving your color palette. I think it's Thank perfect. You. Very complimentary. It was very torn. I mentioned I don't really have any credentials or, or training to be teaching a painting. I've never done anything like this before, but I'd say I've been an artist just as long as I've been a scientist. Really, ever since I was a kid, I loved art just as much. And I've always wanted to find ways to combine these two things that I love. And this was a pretty fun idea. We've done quite a few of these during COVID. So you have to check out our website. We have a whole list of other paint nights for you to follow along. One of them was like a polar bear in front of like the Northern Lights. I think that was my favorite one. Yeah, I'll find the link to that one and uh, throw it into the chat. Yeah. And this one as well, we're recording. And so we'll post it later and you can share it with friends and family. Yes. Yes, if you want to come back and do it again. You know, folks that wanted to attend but couldn't. I know it's a, we're trying to find a time that kind of worked for any time zone. And that's not always super easy. It's kind of dinner time for a lot of folks, but. certainly be able to watch later. I have been shockingly good with my paint amounts today. I am so impressed with myself. I always feel so bad when I do a huge painting and then I have a bunch of waste left over. I'm actually not even used to painting landscapes. I actually used to be a portrait painter. 
It's too specific. Suddenly I had too many portraits in my house and my family said the eyes were following them. It was a little too creepy. So I switched to photography. Just a little more. Okay, and that is my whole background. And if anybody's still catching up, that's totally fine. Like I said, we're gonna leave this background to dry. I have some slides that'll take about 15 to 12 that's drawing, and then we'll come back and draw our wolf on top in a nice black silhouette. Um, I'm worried that those, but that's gonna be a little hard to see on this, on the dark background of the paint to see my uh, pencil drawings. And so I made a little step-by-step -step sheet Let's see if i can attach it here will do but hello once again uh, my name is katie and i'm a rockies and plains representative for defenders of wildlife um, and my job is focused solely on colorado wolves and the wolf reintroduction happening this year um, like i said i'm based out of our denver field office but i travel around the state for our wolf program And I'm sure if you all got this invite that you're familiar with Defenders, but in case not, we are a national wildlife conservation nonprofit organization dedicated to restoring imperiled species and their habitats. I'm part of our Rockies and Plains field conservation team, and we work on the ground Colorado to Montana on critters like wolves, but also grizzly bears, bison, black-footed ferrets, um, prairie dogs, and all sorts of other animals. And a little bit about myself, I have a bachelor's degree in fish, wildlife, and conservation biology from Colorado State University. Um, and I was born here in Colorado, so it's exciting to help see this restoration program succeed and help wolves call this state home once again, too. I'm a wildlife biologist by education and a coexistence specialist by training. I've been at Defenders for almost two years now, um, but was just promoted this spring to lead our Colorado Wolf Program. Um, and before that, I've worked around the world to reduce human wildlife conflict from elephants in Thailand uh, to sea turtles in Mexico, and most recently, prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets out on the Great Plains. And I want to give a little background uh, to the life of a gray wolf, too. So wolves live around six to eight years in the wild. They can live a little bit longer in captivity. They mate in the spring and have pups during, uh, it's called denning season in May and June. And they have litters of four to seven pups, so pretty similar to domestic dogs. Wolves will live, travel, and hunt individually or in social packs of two to 12. And while there are pretty complicated explanations of, of alphas and omegas and all the different ways a packs can assemble, all it really is is a mother, a father, and, their, and a, as a breeding pair and their offspring. So not very unlike many other mammals we know. Wolves are also very adaptable and can live in a wide variety of habitats as long as there's value or uh, available prey. Um, their preferred food are ungulates, which are large hooved mammals, so elk and deer. Um, and elk are probably gonna be the predominant prey here in Colorado, but they can also eat rodents and other critters. An important thing to know is that while well, wolves are really naturally wary of people, uh, and they will usually flee to escape any threats and avoid confrontation. And even in areas where wolves are rebounding, it's really rare to see one in the wild. Uh, if you do come across uh, a wolf, odds are they'll see you and avoid you uh, long before you even realize that they're there. Gray wolves are a carnivore native to Colorado and were hunted out of the state by the 1940s. 
and they were one of the first species to be listed on the Endangered Species Act, and, fed, and they are federally endangered in most of the country still today. There have been reports of lone wolves coming in and out of Colorado since about the early 2000s, um, and a couple packs even since then, but today we only have two in the entire state, um, and that's one adult male and his male offspring in North Park, Colorado. Um, so that original breeding male did come down from the Yellowstone area. They dispersed naturally. Um, they had those pups naturally. They were not part of the reintroduction effort. Um, or just ironically, this all started happening at the same time that this plan was being uh, put together. So I'm gonna hit you with a quiz right away. So true or false, lone wolves are rare wolves who are antisocial and do not wish to be part of a pack. Throw in the chat if you think that's true or false. What's your guess? Zoe, I can't see the chat, so let me know what people are saying. <laughs> Let's see, we've got two falses, another false. Um, still majority false opinion. That is, that is true that it is false. Um, so this is a kind of a misconception that we get from like movies and stories. A lone wolf is actually just a wolf that leaves their parents' pack and they become a lone wolf when they're in search of their own mate and territory to form a new pack. It's actually the exact kind of opposite definition of what people think a lone wolf really is. And restoring wolf populations is so important because they are what biologists call a keystone species. And that's a species that has an irrepla uh, irreplaceable essential role in their ecosystem. Wolves can enhance prey populations by taking weak and sick animals in the herd, leaving only the strongest to survive and reproduce. Wolves can lead to decreased coyote populations, which benefit smaller prey and other mid-sized carnivores like foxes. And this effect can help reestablish a balanced community of carnivores. So once a wolf comes in, they're not the only carnivore on their landscape. Each one kind of fills its own little specific niche in that ecosystem. Leftovers from wolf kills serve as food for many scavenger species like vultures and eagles. Good news for birders. Wolves keep grazers like elk and deer on the move, and this prevents overgrazing in any one area and can result in increased plant and insect biodiversity in that area. And that improved vegetation provides food and shelter for beavers who create dams and help rivers healthy, keep rivers healthy and lessen the effects of drought in an area. And this is just a snapshot of why wolves are so important to the wild places that we love. That's why Defenders has been a, a leader in wolf coexistence in the Rockies for over 35 years. And we're able to bring a lot of that institutional knowledge to our work here in Colorado. There are a lot of different definitions and ideas of coexistence, but ours is simply helping people share the landscape and thrive and finding solutions to those conflicts that arise. We have five staff working across the country on wolf restoration from gray wolves and Mexican gray wolves out here in the West to red wolves out in the Southeast. We also created the first wolf depredation compensation program in the Northern Rockies, which ran for 23 years and distributed $1.4 million in compensation for livestock losses nationwide. And that program gave states a model to take over that role for themselves, and that was transitioned to the states. And so we've shifted our focus to conflict minimization efforts on the ground with producers. And seeing the dispersal of wolves trying to come down to Colorado, we began working with partners in North Park, Colorado, where those two wolves currently are, several years ago to support training opportunities and implement wolf deterrence. But why Colorado specifically for, for reintroduction? Habitat connectivity is a huge driver for not only wolves, but all endangered species in the, wolf, in the world today. And that's how, as, as humans come in, all of that wildlife habitat gets kind of disconnected from each other. And now all these animals can flow very freely between one another. Um, and a reintroduction effort would allow Colorado to reconnect wolf habitats from Mexico to the Arctic. And that's a pretty credible achievement that really can't be done without this one state. 
Colorado also has the best unoccupied suitable wolf habitat left in the lower 48 states. Um, and I'll show a map here on the next slide of where all of that habitat is. Um, we also have really abundant native prey. Or, um, and so mainly deer and elk. Colorado has about 300,000 elk, which is nearly as much as Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana combined. And those states have more elk now than they did before the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction. And in general, Coloradans today have really strong conservation ethics, values for the environment, um, and pride in our natural heritage. Um, and those three things put us in a really great position to do things differently and even be a leader for our neighboring states living with wolves. And ultimately, we owe it to future generations to bring back this native carnivore while we can through a responsible science-based restoration plan. And we are almost there. So this map shows um, the historic range of wolves in that dark gray color. Um, in that chocolate brown color is what's left of their suitable habitat after human um, development. And so see just if we were able to put wolves in all of those brown areas, look how disconnected those still are from one another. The areas that they currently occupy are in that orange color. Those are a few recent developments and this, this map needs to be updated. Um, this is largely still the same. So we have our Northern Rockies population expanding into Washington, into Oregon. We have quite a few packs now in California. That's super exciting. We have the Mexican gray wolves to the South. It's a, um, a subspecies that, that is also um, on the federally endangered species list. And then wolves in the uh, Great Lakes states. And this shows us that even with 25 years of reintroduction and restoration efforts, gray wolves only occupy 10% of their historic range. And that's why this conversation has shifted from conservation to restoration. We don't wanna stop at 10%, we wanna restore species to where they belong. It also shows us how if we zoom in on Colorado, the whole Western half of the state has that last large swath of good habitat and how Colorado is kind of this missing puzzle piece to connecting a lot of these wolf populations and up into Canada. In 2020, Defenders was part of a major unprecedented effort to bring um, back an endangered species by ballot measure. Um, so Coloradans voted in favor of reintroducing gray wolves to the state, tasking with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW, um, with three key things. One, to create a science-based restoration plan. Two, to take steps to reintroduce wolves west of the Continental Divide, also called the West Slope, where all of that suitable wolf habitat is by December 31st, 2023. So the last day of this year. And three, to help wolf uh, resolve wolf livestock conflicts and compensate producers for losses caused by gray wolves. And since the, the ballot measure was passed, um, a lot's been happening behind the scenes and how CPW has gone about this process of creating a management plan has already set us apart from all of the other states. The agency started by appointing two collaborative advisory groups. One was a, a technical working group of biologists and wolf experts from across the country to look at the best available science, management practices, lessons learned from other states and guide biological recommendations to make this reintroduction a success. And the second was a stakeholder advisory group. And that was a group of uh, NGOs, non-government organizations like defenders, ranchers, hunters, outfitters, wolf advocates, business owners, recreationists, all the different people represented in Colorado um, and from around the state. And so we even had a staff person from defenders appointed to this group and they met to discuss the social impacts of wolf management. So like uh, conflict prevention, compensation, education, and outreach. And both of these groups met for 18 months to find consensus they could recommend to CPW. And those recommendations largely shaped the final plan. Um, and that was unanimously approved this May after another round of, of public comment. So in the last two years, it's, it's really been this uh, management planning effort. And so what's in it? So the now final um, wolf restoration and management plan includes all of the details of when, where, and how this reintroduction is going to take place, as well as how to manage any conflicts that arise. So during phase one, CPW will be capturing and releasing 10 to 15 wild gray wolves 
from the Northern Rockies for the next three to five years. So a total of 30 to 50 wolves in five years. They'll release GPS collared wolves um, on state or private land during the winter months. Um, in these two zones here, this is a Northern zone and a Southern zone. This year, they'll just be working on this Northern zone. So Glenwood Springs, Aspen Vale area, um, and then we have the I-70 corridor kind of going straight through the middle. And these areas, um, how they were kind of chosen was a mixture of a, a scientific study that was done, but they're also 60 miles from any state or tribal border. And so we want to release them here to make sure, try to make sure that they'll stay within the state once they're released. We've taken off the state endangered species list. There's a state and a federal endangered species list. Currently, they're endangered on both. They'll be taken off the state list when there are at least 200 wolves in the state um, or, or 150 for two years, whichever comes first. And our biggest win during um, our opportunity to comment on this plan was the removal of a possible hunting season for wolves in Colorado. Um, the final plan now has no mention of hunting, but long-term management will be reassessed once they reach that 200 mark. And even though it's rare for wolves to kill livestock and most producers will never experience conflicts, there can be a really significant impact to in individual producers. So the plan also includes a generous compensation program for losses caused by livestock um, and work to minimize conflict through the agency. There are incentives, but no requirements for livestock owners to implement non-lethal conflict prevention. Um, and being able to predict and mitigate those interactions before they happen is really critical to saving wolves, livestock, and people from uh, needless conflict. And as the plan unfolds and wolves are released, um, Defenders is very dedicated to helping CPW and um, producers bridge that gap and pro provide resources to increase coexistence around the state. So what will happen this winter? Um, like I said, December 31st is our deadline. So CPW will be releasing 10 to 15 wolves from the Northern Rockies um, between December and March. So they're not all gonna arrive all at once in one group. They'll probably come down in groups of two to three. Um, and if the wolves and the weather allow, the goal is to fly the wolves down by helicopter with as little holding time as possible. So they're gonna come down and they're immediately going to be let right out. The agency recently announced that up to 10 individuals this winter will come from Oregon, um, and other agreements are in process with the Nez Perce Tribal Nation located in Idaho, um, and other groups after the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho all declined to participate. The Northern Rockies is the most ideal place to source wolves because it's the most similar to Colorado. So while there's a lot of wolves in like the Great Lakes states, um, there's not very many elk out there, so they're not used to eating um, that kind of uh, predominant prey. The terrain is quite different, and so we want to try and match um, where they're coming from and where they're going to as much as we can. And the ones being chosen to come to Colorado will be young, healthy, um, and have no recent history of conflict. So what is Defenders doing now to help this reintroduction be a success? Like I said, we've had quite a role in the planning process. And now that that's over, um, our goal is really to provide expertise, financial and logistical uh, support to minimize wolf livestock conflicts so that producers and healthy wolf populations can thrive. And we're working at that goal by providing workshops and training opportunities to producers and other stakeholders who are interested in conflict minimization tools and techniques. Um, this summer, I've been largely helping track the two wolves currently in Jackson County um, and working with ranchers in nearby areas to monitor for potential activity on their properties. We also fund many large and small scale uh, coexistence projects like increasing human presence on the landscape. Um, it's called range riding. So if you think a cowboy, a cowgirl, it's what we call a range rider and deploying wolf deterrence on ranching operations. Um, and we're always exploring new and creative ideas too. And importantly, we're fostering relationships with, with other NGOs, universities, agencies, hunters, and ranchers um, to develop long-term visions and innovative and sustainable solutions to conflict. And when I'm out in the, um, I'm advocating in the state legislature into the CPW commission and other decision makers to help shape stronger wolf policies. 
And finally, there are also some things that you can do to help wolves be successful in Colorado. First, a huge thing you can do is continuing to learn about wolves. They're so interesting. They're so intelligent. Talk about them to your family at the dinner table, um, friends on social media, any opportunity to, to cut the stigma around wolves um, and combat any, any misidentification or uh, uh, misinterpretations out there um, really helps go a long way. Advocate and vote for officials, policies, and initiatives that support wildlife. Um, politicians especially, but I mean, look at the Endangered Species Act and the um, Proposition 114 that, that voted wolves to be reintroduced are just two examples of how policy um, and voting really shapes um, the survival of wildlife in those wild places that we love. Report any wolf sightings to Colorado Parks and Wildlife if you are in the state, even if you're not sure. Um, they have a wolf reporting form on their website. Sign up for Defenders Action Alerts um, and get it involved with locally. So you'd get emails um, like this for this paint night and from me and my folks at the Denver office if there's any volunteer opportunities, events, or opportunities to come uh, testify with us and engage in the legislative session. And of course, support organizations like Defenders that are working to find solutions, protect wildlife, and reduce conflict. And there's one more exciting opportunity. If you are a Colorado resident starting, I believe, January 2024, um, you can get the new Born to be Wild Colorado license plate. So thanks to some of our allies and Governor Polis, um, this was a, a Senate bill that was passed earlier this spring. And the proceeds from this plate will directly fund CPW's non-lethal wolf coexistence efforts. And it's just a very cool license plate. Yeah, I'm loving it. That was a lot of information. Um, so feel free to take down my contact info um, if, if questions come up later or if there's any questions in the chat, I'd be happy to answer. I was curious, Katie, are there, I don't know if you would know this or not, but are there significant differences or any differences between the wolf breeds, the various wolf breeds besides, you know, their appearance, obviously? What do you mean by wolf breeds? Like as in the variety. Like why they like, like red wolves, gray wolves, the Mexican gray wolves. Yeah. Yeah. So red wolves and gray wolves are two different species. Um, and Mexican gray wolves are also uh, a distinct subspecies of gray wolves. Um, that have their own Endangered Species Act listing. Within each of those species, so like gray wolves, for example, can, can range from bright white to dark black and brown and, and a bunch of different shades in between. So a lot of times they look very different, but and that's why it's really easy to mistake them for coyotes. But all the same species and the ones coming from the Northern Rockies and coming to Colorado are all gonna be the same species too. But we want to make sure that there's that really good genetic flow in all of these populations. That's why connecting those habitats is really important and why we probably some of see some of those differences today is just those the isolation of those habitats. Gotcha. Very cool. But in different areas, we definitely see wolves behave a little bit differently depending on what their main, main prey is. So like I said, wolves in the Great Lakes don't have elk. So they have to rely more on, on deer, uh, on moose in, in Canada and those kinds of areas. But even out here in, in Colorado, I mean, we have a pretty, pretty big prairie dog population. I've seen wolves hunt prairie dogs out in Colorado. That's pretty wild. Um, they'll even eat beaver in the Northern Rockies. They're pretty opportunistic critters. Oh yeah, Maggie is saying that she didn't know there were wolves in the Great Lakes area. Yes, so Minnesota is the one state that they're federally threatened instead of endangered because there's, there's quite a few. But still call it Eastern Gray Wolf instead of Northern Rockies Wolf. And so the genetic diversity, like the sourcing different packs from different areas is just important for health reasons, minimizing uh, things there. Yeah, it's for, for health um, to prevent, you know, any any inbreeding. And so all the individuals being picked to come down will, will probably be unrelated if they can if they can handle that. Um, just to get that kind of mix of diversity in there. And that's why hopefully we'll be able to get some from a bunch of different states. If maybe uh, Montana and Wyoming and Idaho down the line are willing to contribute, um, then we'll have a pretty good little melting pot of di diversity down in Colorado. 
that's very exciting. I'm excited. Yeah, genetics are pretty interesting though. So they they found that like the dark black wolves actually have a greater resistance to to certain diseases compared to all the other colors. So it's very interesting. I'm not a geneticist, but there's some crazy stuff. Oh yeah, are you talking about the Alexander Archipelagio wolf? Is that the one you're talking about, or are you talking about a different one? I'm talking about a different one. Okay, okay, just curious. We don't have any more questions in the chat at this time, but everyone's welcome to continue to throw them in there as they come up. Um, yeah, yeah. Feel free to throw them in there, and we can hit them at the very end if there's anything more. Let's see what paint's drawn. My paint's dry, so we can go ahead and get started with our wolf. Maybe we'll start with the rock for now, and then I can kind of talk through those steps once we get to the wolf. Sounds good. That sounds. All right, so I'm going to start back up with this kind of medium little brown brush, round brush little guy. Get him a little wet. And then we're just going to do some solid black for the whole silhouette. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a cliff kind of coming in the very front of our mountains. And then we're going to have the wolf kind of right on top. So I'm going to start looking at my frontmost mountain. I'm going to start about halfway down to the bottom of the the bottom of the canvas. So we're going to go here a few inches from the bottom. This one can be a little smoother because it's closer up. I have mine going a little bit of an angle. Let's move down. It reminds me of Red Rocks Amphitheater. It totally does. I'm actually or headed Pride to Red Rock. Rocks. <laughs> I was going to say I'm headed to Red Rocks tomorrow. So. Oh, that's very exciting. Not that gray wolves are necessarily going to be in Red Rocks, but <laughs> that's what it's reminding me of. It's going to fill in with our biggest brush. And our outline is thick enough that just go right to the edge. All the way to the bottom. Pull that guy in. Remembering our edges. And there is my platform. So all that is left is our wolf. And this is the only kind of hard part. So I'm going to pull this up. And I'm just going to kind of talk through what I'm doing on my canvas. But I think you can also zoom in on that if you'd rather watch that part. But I'm going to try with my pencil. And I'm going to go, let's see, maybe two inches from the, the tip of my cliff here and go to the left. And then I'm going to go up another two inches and I'm going to make about a two inch wide circle. It's okay if you're a little messy because we're going to cover it up in black. So we have about a two inch wide circle. I'm put a little dot in the very middle of my circle. And then from the dot, I'm going to look up and to the right. So looking diagonally up and to the right, about a two, another two inches away from my little circle or my little dot in the center, I'm going to make a really smaller circle, about an inch wide. Just like that. So we have a big circle that's going to be like his chest and his shoulders. And then we have a little, little circle up and to the right. And that's going to be his head. And I'm going to make another little dot in the middle of my little circle. And if we look like he's howling up to like our back peak, our fourth mountain, 
I'm going to start with my little dot in the center of the tiny circle and make it going to be his snout. So it's going to cover about halfway in the circle and halfway out of the circle. Just like that. So the big circle, a little circle, and an oval halfway in our little circle. And now I'm going to go back to my big circle and go to the top edge. And I'm going to go right across to the left, about another two, two-ish inches. And I'm going to make a, a medium-sized circle. So a little bit smaller than the big one, but bigger than the head. And that's going to be their rump. about that size. And so that's step one, that screen sharing on my screen right now is where I'm at. And now we really just gotta start connecting the circles. So I'm gonna start at his rump, at the far left-hand side of my circle. And I'm gonna go, and again, it's okay to be a little stronger with the pencil since we're gonna be covering this up with black. I'm gonna be going right across to the top of my big circle. And they should be pretty much across from each other, but I'm going to make a little, just a little dip in his back. Kind of look at a dog. They don't have a straight back all the way. They got a little bit of dip that goes here in the middle. And then I'm going to keep following that up from the top of my big circle to the side of my little circle with his neck. There's a little bit of sharp, but that's okay. Smooth that out a little bit. So now I'm at the top left-hand side of my head, and I'm going to keep following that around kind of to his eyebrow. I'm going to start angling down, following the edge of my circle, and then go to the edge of my oval. And follow the edge of the oval to the tip, and that's going to be his nose. So I want to flatten the nose just a little bit on the flat or on the top end of that oval. Just flatten out, and then keep following your pencil line of the oval down, down, down until you hit the circle again. And now we want our wolf to be howling, right? So we're going to go the line we just finished, make a little bit of a notch, a little bit of a chin, and dip back, back down to the right-hand side of our circle head. Right from there, we're going to keep going, follow our neck down to the right side of our biggest circle. All right, just to finish out the head area, I'm gonna start at the dot that I made in the center of that smallest circle and go straight left to the edge. And we're gonna make an ear. They have pretty, pretty small, broad ears. They're not very pointy. And they're probably gonna be like leaning back a little bit like this. Just kind of a little triangle shape for his ear. And so now we've done everything in step number three of that walkthrough. And now we're going to start on the leg. So this is probably the hardest part, I'm going to say. And we're not going to worry about the paws because they're going to be covered by a rock that's in the front. Because they're going to be standing up, right? So we don't have to worry about the paws. But I'm going to start at the bottom, very bottom of my biggest circle. And I'm going to cut kind of diagonal, round diagonal up towards the middle of my medium circle. It's a slight curve like that. So if you imagine their chest kind of rounding up to the belly, we don't have a big pot belly on our wolf. He's gonna, gonna cut kind of up into that hind end. And then where that line that we just met meets the side of our little circle, we're gonna bend down and create our thigh. So we're gonna create a curve that ends kind of right in line with the end of the circle. So swoop that right down. And then I'm gonna start at the end of that circle on the other end and finish that off. So I'm gonna curve around his bottom, curve around, cut a little bit in, and then start cutting to the left, they kind of have that angle, it's kind of like their, their knee pit is kind of where we're at. 
and then the bottom of their foot so it flattens out like this. So we get this kind of like little diagonal zigzag shape. And then we're just going to fill that in on the other side. You can pretty much follow the first lines that you made. Well, it's looking a little tall, but that's okay. We can fix that with the clip later. A little bit of the belly. So following the curve of the back of his thigh, we're going to keep following that towards the ground. Keep following that all the way till you hit your cliff. And then again, we're kind of just going to match what we what we did on this side. Give them that flat kind of angle until it gonna cut this upright into here. With a silhouette, the legs kind of end up looking like peg legs. Like you only got two legs when they're right in line like this. So we want to show that other leg kind of going behind the front leg that's facing us. And that gives us our hind leg. So that's the first part of that step four. And now to do our front legs, I'm gonna start here at the chest, follow our circle around till about, if we're thinking about here's his shoulders, his arms are gonna drop down about here. Just gonna kind of use a pretty straight line. This leg's looking pretty straight. And then the, to finish out the other side of that leg, I'm just gonna go about the width of that my other legs have been, give him a little bit of an elbow, give him a little bit of an angle, but then cut back towards parallel with that first line. We're gonna go back to our big circle on the left side of our circle, follow around like we did the first time, and start with the left side of this final leg. Give them a little bend in the leg again, but these can be pretty straight. And straighten that leg out. So I have all four of my legs. All I need now is my tail. And for some reason, this is like the hardest part because mine always ends up kind of looking like a Australian shepherd tail. It's got like a little curve to it, not that bushy. Um, and their tails are actually usually kind of between their legs or just like hanging straight down. And so I'm sticking them out a little bit more than they normally would just so we can see that tail. up looking a little bit like a bushy horse tail, but that's okay. It's pretty fitting. They're pretty fluffy. And so here's our final outline. And as we go in with the paint, we can add some little details for giving like little tufts of fur sticking up to make him look just a little bit more realistic. Um, and then I will probably have to bring my cliff up a little bit because you're looking a little tall. So we can do that too when we go in. For our final outline, I'm going to take my smallest brush now. So he's about the, about the size of a regular pencil tip, of like a wooden pencil tip. And I still have leftover black paint from my cliff, but if you need more, pour some more in the palette. You can have to mix them around just so it doesn't get dry on top. And just brush it off on the edges so you have kind of a sharp point. And I'm actually going to start with my tail. I'm going from left to right if I can so that my hand isn't like touching the paint if I don't, if I can avoid it. And so I'm just going to swoop them like that to where he meets the body. You can have the tail connect to the body in quite a few places. It doesn't have to be like a like a hair ponytail. It's pretty bushy. And then I'm going to start on my back leg. So following this curve that we made. And some of this is if you have a dog at home, look how your dog's legs look. They're kind of funny if you've ever looked too hard.
swoop that up to my circle. And going on my other leg and kind of follow this curve down like we did with the pencil. Fill in the rump while we're here. You can fill in later with a bigger brush if you like, but I'm just going to fill in with my little one here. He's small enough. Run along the back. So I'm going to go all the way from his behind. Straight line. Through the back. And then go right up into the neck and up towards his head. I'll follow my circle a little bit. We have his eyebrow as we come kind of down where his eyes is to his snout. Make sure to give him a little broad snout. And a little ear. Hey, Katie, if you want to, um, at your earliest convenience, stop sharing your screen maybe so we can see more detail and I'll try okay. to link, uh, I'll link the, the, um, does the canvas have the full screen again? Yes, yes, that's perfect. perfect. And I've put the how to paint a wolf, a wolf in the, the chat. So hopefully we'll awesome. be able to Thank access you. That. So I'm up here by our head and I'm putting the little notch in his mouth. So he looks like he's howling. And come down with the chin. Now I'm going to start kind of at his chest and go sweep all the way up his neck. All the way up that pencil line that we made. And just start filling that in. Now I'm going to start at this belly, kind of cutting towards the back end, towards the front, and just sweep all the way across. And then you can fill in the belly. He went from a tall wolf to kind of a chunky wolf. To think of a good name. Connect these two all the way around and go towards my front legs. Like I said, these are pretty straight. Not too much bend in these, but I want to give them a little bit of a little bit of detail. So I just gotta swipe, swipe my brush down. Thing on the back. Give him that elbow and back up. And that's the core of our wolf body. I'm just gonna go in with a couple more details. I wanna define his fur a little more. So I'm gonna try and get my brush as pointy as I can. Just a little bit of paint and just make these like little, little notches of fur sticking out. It's a little disheveled. Not flat, he's fluffy. I'm gonna give him a little couple chest hairs too. Maybe a couple more. back of his tail. And there, my new friends, is our wolf painting. We have a wolf howling at the Rocky Mountains. We know it's happening this year with the Colorado Wolf Reintroduction. 
And Zoe's got that how-to in the chat if you need a little bit more time or if you want to save this for later. I can try to get that sent around with the uh, follow-up email that goes out to you all too so that you all have that. Um, and like we mentioned at the beginning, this video has been recorded so we can put it on our YouTube later um, so you can watch it again um, for anybody who got to miss. I have to say you're Wolf's very handsome. He's looking very Thank good. you. I think he is as well. <laughs> He's quite fluffy. <laughs> But I think he turned but out in a good way. Cute. He's very fall themed. Definitely. And if anybody has any more questions, that's that's our whole painting. I'd love to see everybody else's if we're all finished. Also, feel free to email me pictures afterwards. I will stay on for a couple more minutes in case any questions come up, but otherwise it was so great uh, being able to paint with all of you tonight. I hope you had fun. Um, I sure had fun and I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>